And now, Licia Verde, who is going to tell us whether we just <laughs> failed <laughs> or she was entertained or whatever. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, I was asked to give some closing remark of this uh, wonderful conference. And uh, so here it is. So I am the person here that knows the least about machine learning, has worked the least about machine learning. And so we got the view from, is that a pointer? From, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's virtual. Ooh. Or you can point. Look at this thing. Look at that. Ah. <laughs> what? Well, from this tail, but now I'm giving the view from the other tail, from that tail there. Um, and so I want to go back to the previous uh, edition of uh, this meeting back in, uh, in 2021. And there was a debate there where I was uh, part of, and that's what I said in that de debate. And the title of the debate, uh, what would it take for the community to accept the finding? That is, you, there is a, a, a new result that come from machine learning application. And would the community be convinced? And I remember I said, you know, how do you convince the people in Stockholm to give you the big prize given how big your, your uh, finding is? And so at that time, we discuss. It really depends on the question. And you have to ask yourself, what is the question? Because a finding is always an answer to a question. And so the question, the, we deal with several different question things like what is the smallest possible error on a parameter X given the model? And we don't care whether the model is right or wrong. Or I like to understand the physical processes that go on in the universe. Is there a sign of new physics out there? Or is the model, Lambda CDM model, correct? or I want to classify object, or I want to model my instrument response, or I want to sift through a huge amount of data and find relatively rare events of interest, or I have a complex exact model, like say simulation, that are anybody, and then they have the whole baryonic physics on top of it, and I need a fast way to interpolate or emulate, or do we want something that works or do we want something that describes nature? And it really depends what you want to do, how you're going to address it and whether the uh, people in uh, uh, Stockholm will believe you. And then I set up a trap and I made the audience vote anonymously. So this is the trap. I gave up an hypothetical scenario 10 years from now and where you got this sort of scenario, right? Where in the, the Lambda CDM prediction is what the cross between the vertical black line. The axes are two parameters you choose. One is W, the other one is omega matter, one is deviation from GR, the other one, you care, it doesn't matter. One is non-Gaussianity, you care, it doesn't matter. And the blue one is the traditional analysis, and the purple one, first I made an example with the bias spectrum, <laughs> and then I make the example with, uh, with machine learning. And then I let people choose which one of these uh, uh, cases they would, uh, they would believe. And then I ask, should the ac acceptance of the result depend on the agreement of the finding with your preconception, that is your expectation or whatever the model tell you? And the answer was no. And then I ask, does or will the accept that depends on the agreement of the finding with the preconception? And now I show the results of the poll. And it turns out that people voted in such a way that indeed the trust of the poll indicated the contrary. Indicated that they will trust the machine learning approach if it confirmed their belief, like the Lambda CDM, but they did not trust it. They would prefer the traditional approach if it did not. So in 2023 edition language, we have to beware of confirmation bias. Okay. So again, I went on what would, it take, that, uh, what would we do then to actually move beyond this. 
and uh, independently of the outcome, especially if the outcome is new physics, and then there were a whole sort of condition that came out, explain exactly how ML was used, there are different things, whether you want to sift through the large amount of data, whether you are classifying, whether you are interpolating, uh, you want to substitute the end-to-end -end process, or you want to explain what feature your machine learning picks up, you want to explain what the physical meaning of the feature, you want to com convince that you use your machine learning within the boundary of the training set, you want a convincing error budget, and there may be other things that we may want to add to this list. And then I ask, how do we go there? And there are a series of things of what would get us there, like a good track record of how performing the standard analysis, where we have a validation set on subset of the data. So the subset is so that we can get on the subset with the machine learning the same precision as from the full set on the traditional analysis, and then we can check whether there's consistency there, perform cut, and a good coverage of the error. We had a talk this time also on that, clear demonstration of the robustness, softly impose physics in the machine learning approach, blind analysis, and then I say, well, we better start now because 10 years go on relatively fast. And so we can discuss whether we want to add other entries with everything that we've uh, learned since then. So there's a program to develop and um, there's, there's surely more, and we should uh, keep the, the discussing this. And this makes me, and then we come to this year, and we had five days, 12 hours of talk, eight hours of review talk, 4.5 hours of debate. There's no way I can summarize all this in any other way that, uh, you know, about the JPEG of... <laughs> So one thing that struck me was, compared to other conferences I've been to, is the low average age of the participant. I think this is really good. <laughs> and, uh, but this also brings me to the Planck principle. Do you know what the Planck principle is? A scientific truth does not triumph, or well, scientific process doesn't happen because the opponent gets convinced, but because the old generation eventually retires or die. And since I'm on the tail end, and probably this is very relevant to me, take all the rest that I'm going to say with a grain of salt and inform by the following. All right, so some con consideration. Now, uh, again, instead of, in, instead of summarizing, I'm going to give you what I think are some recurrent themes, but again, seen from the tailing end. Okay. So two years later, there is much more awareness and much more maturity from my point of view. While there was not a coherent program, as we were discussing two years ago, a lot of work has been done, and this theme kept uh, surfacing uh, throughout the conference. And so uh, it made me think about this. You, I'm, I'm sure you are, you are aware of this. This is the cycle of technology hype, or the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, there is a technology trigger. The technology trigger was probably, you know, 10 years ago in a different field, and then it percolated into, into, into astronomy. And then I have the impression that maybe two years ago we were climbing towards the peak of inflated expectation. And now I don't know exactly where we are, whether we are, you know, sliding down towards the trough of disillusionment or we are climbing up the slope of enlightenment. But uh, we are getting somewhere, I mean, as, as maturity progresses, you, know, you can decide yourself where you think we are. And in terms of the program, I was thinking, you know, maybe a mini snowmass kind of thing where, you know, a, a community come together and say, what do we need to do? Where are the priority? Are, or, are all the effort not uh, clashing with each other and not overlapping? I mean, of course, they were spending much more money, but, you know, considering the carbon footprint of what we do, maybe we should also consider that. So, some consideration on data. Machine learning thrives on big data for training or for making sense of the data or for sifting through the data, and we heard in the first talk and, and many times about complexity of the data. 
Let me just repeat something. Simulations are not data. I've heard many people point to the simulation and say these are the data. There are mock data, with these are end-to-end -end simulations that try to emulate everything that you would get when you would actually look at the data. There are idealized data, model-generated data, and then there are data data. These are the real data. These are not the same thing. They are profoundly different. And I let you think in how many ways they are profoundly different. So I have a proposal. Let's not call everything data. Let's call the mock data M data, the idealized data I data, and the data data just data. So we know what we are talking about, and we know they all come with their own uh, shortcoming and advantages. On prior or biases, uh, the training data, which in this context are M data or I data most of the time, will give a building prior in whatever comes out of there. The architecture we have seen would also give a building prior on whatever comes there. What I'm saying is this, that it's not good or it's not bad, but it's there. We may want to use it in a in an advantageous way, but it's there and we have to deal with it. And we have to be completely honest about it and open about it if we want to convince the tale of the distribution and the people in, uh, in Stockholm. On the universe, again, machine learning tries on big data and we only have one universe, duh. And so we go back to complexity and some of the points that were made in the, in the opening talk. Now, not all astronomy and context and application deal with this in the same way. In some cases, there can be repeated observation. In, co in some cases, there are contexts where confirmation and follow-up is the, na the, the, the aim, like planets and transit. There are cases where you may have potosy, where you have good training set and not just one, versus the case of cosmological parameter. You get given one universe, that's your only shot. So, it really, again, depends on the question we're trying to answer, and we should not confound different things from this point of view. It's very important to specify well what is the question and why finding an answer is of value and what the value of that answer will be. I think sometimes we are like too much caught into, I have this, I want to do that, but then I don't ask what is the real added value and why am I asking this question? And this will help given the fact that no, we only have one universe. Then some consideration on truth. Truth came up in day by two and in day by two everywhere. So we are after fundamental physics and we are, most of us, looking at up the sky to find that. But uh, when we think about fundamental physics, all the way to actually look at the data, there are many different layers of idealization and modeling. So the physical law is not the same as symmetry, is not the same as a conceptual framework. If we talk about GR or quantum mechanics, we are talking about a conceptual framework or what is reality. Theory is something else, thinks about string theory of inflation. It's a different qualitative value than, say, quantum mechanics. Model, it's something completely else. Lambda CDM, WCDM. Again, it's a different thing. It still lives in the realm of theory and modeling, but it's a different kind of thing. An effective model is yet something else. You know, there is a linear relation between redshift and distance. It's an effective model. Or an empirical relation, uh, the periluminosity relation for the, for the Cepheid that, that then has an explanation, or the Phillips relation for the supernovae, these are all empirical relations. So not all models and not all modeling are created equal. And understanding is not describing, and fitting cosmological parameters is not understanding. So when we talk about the truth and we put machine learning into the mix, this kind of questions come up even if you do traditional, uh, traditional approaches. But they, we have to reconsider them again in this new context and figure out what is the added value of these new uh, things, which I don't want to call tool because we go back to the <laughs> one of the open questions from, uh, from the first talk. The other things that come to mind is epicycles. So here I have a picture of the geocentric model with uh, all the epicycles. 
Then the heliocentric model came along, but uh, with uh, Copernicus, it still had the epicycle. And then it took a while until we got Kepler and Newton that gave us something more like a physical law. Yet, I want to point out uh, that this worked well enough for a very long time. Christoph Columbus has covered America based on this thing. I mean, you know. Uh, so uh, when we have a black box machine learning algorithm result, we may have something like this. But if it worked well enough and was useful, it, it works. So although we may be more better at intellectual satisfaction if we go more for something like that. So in different contexts, again, we have all these different contexts, and I heard that about the ML COG. Doing astronomy is complex. Uh, there are several different moving parts. There are several different parts of the process. And uh, we have a few extra cogs, and you may want to use different kind of approaches for the different cogs, depending on what you are after. And uh, something, again, to keep in mind when interpreting the results. So on new results, let's go back to, the, to one of the open questions in the opening talk. And Brismenar said, are there the new results that we have ML enhanced or ML enabled? Where enhanced means that you make it faster, you make it cheaper, but enabled means that it would have been otherwise impossible, you would not have found it. And then he concluded by saying, is it just a tool? If it's just a tool, then you are on the ML enhanced end of the uh, part. I don't think this is actually a dichotomy. I don't think it's either or. I think it's, you know, there's a all shade of uh, color from, you know, what is orange to green, say. Uh, because think about the internal combustion engine, right? When the internal combustion engine came out and the first few cars came out, there's nothing you could not do with a carriage that you could do with an internal combustion engine. So it was probably not faster and probably not cheaper either. And it was just a tool, yet it has changed the world and now, you know, <laughs> we couldn't live without internal combustion. Well, we are trying to, but anyway. Uh, the internet is something different. There were things that you could do for an internet that you couldn't do before and it still changed the world. So I think it's a continuous here and you can have just a tool but that will be disrupting and will make possible things that other, are otherwise impossible. So uh, it may be just a question of time. And I want to uh, add that there is, I think, a different, uh, another uh, direction to this uh, scale, which goes into clearing the path toward the truth and discovering the truth. And I make it orthogonal to the previous uh, end, because I think it's not obvious which end align which, which, uh, with which end. Um, so on the elephant in the room that enter, <laughs> <laughs> that entered this year and was not much here, the, uh, the previous edition, is interpretability. So we heard a lot about making the black box transparent. And we, but not only reducing dimensionality, reducing complexity, we even heard connection with the, with the Fisher infor information matrix. Uh, we discussed about the truth in later space. I was blown away by the uh, result of symbolic regression, constant learning, and all these things about response, saliency map, sens sensitivity maps that helps you interpret what this black box is doing. Also, I also heard things like, I want to believe, <laughs> which, you know, it's not too promising. Uh, probably a combination of approaches is what will get us there if we actually want to understand 
uh, and make the black box transparent. But it's not just making the black box transparent, it's also shaping the box itself and its content. We all heard about uh, geometric deep learning, and I want to mention the, the physics inform neural network, just because there is an effort going on in my uh, home institution where basically the understanding is that if you have partial differential equation, you can write them into uh, a neural net and then use that to solve them much easy, much faster. And you know, physics is a lot of those type of equations, so, and astronomy is a lot of those type of equations, so it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. And so, again, you see, I see two different approaches here. You can either R-code uh, the physics in, or you can put it in the loss function, and then you just impose it through the loss function. And again, probably a combination of approaches will be what will uh, help us through. So attention is all you need, we've heard. And uh, I think this is related to the bit, bit deep think disappointing answer, which is again related to making the box transparent or with what was also said in terms of produce new measurement. So if you want to have a new result, you need to associate that to some new measurement. Uh, me producing some new measurement, probably from the same data, means that you have to focus your attention on something that you hadn't looked at before, and that will protect you from the disappointing answer of the thing when you say, where is that W not equal to minus one coming from? What if I look at all of this data? So I'm going to give you an example. That's an exercise for you. Let's say uh, about detecting neutrino masses. We know that the next generation galaxy surveys, some of them are already ongoing, have enough statistical power in principle, if everything is under control, to detect neutrino masses from looking up at the sky. And now you choose the neutrino mass you prefer, say we detect a 0 0.095 EV or 0 0.069 EV. Now, these are qualitatively slightly different things because in one case, you are putting it at the minimum level for the inverted hierarchy, and in the other case, you put it at the level where it's only normal hierarchy and, and, and not inverted hierarchy. So there are important consequences of which number you, you, you pick. There are important consequences for those that are making very expensive particle physics experiment. Okay. So anyway, so how would you know if when you get this result, you get one of these, or you are going to get a few of those. You know what those are, right? So what would you ask your, um, when you're writing the paper? Let's just, let's just put it in this way. In this way. Um, peer review, referee, start with the authors. When the authors start writing the paper, start thinking about the project, need to think, what do I have to do in order that when I produce the results of this uh, work, I will convince the community, and I will convince a sample of the community which happened to be the referee. So what things would you ask yourself, or you were the referee, what would you ask? Well, if, it's, if you repeat it with the same data because it's the same survey, uh, you have to change something because repeating just by repeating it's not going to help. In, 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 in other contexts, it does help, but since we only have one universe, it's not going to help. New, New York, you can intervene as well. Anyone? More data, as always. <laughs> no? Nobody wants to ask? More, another question? Uh, more data. No, how would you confirm? How you, you don't have to data. You have to write the paper, you have to submit it, and then you have to convince your referee that uh, that's correct and it's got to accept your paper and maybe send you to Stockholm. What are you going to put there? You say, well, I have my uh, neural network, I give it the survey, you chew on it for a few hours and tell me that that's the neutrino mass. And then what do you do? What's your about? 
you want another experiment to confirm it? Uh, I, I hope that you have null tests and the ore bars no, and no tests of the statistics and uh, well, essentially it boils down to null tests and uh, and how you do, how you made the analysis. I mean that that's that's pretty important thing. But, but that's also what we have seen also in uh, a lot of like the past experiments. I mean, Planck like had like a number of like competing analyses. I guess that Euclid will have quite a few. <laughs> uh, I guess that's uh, non it's non unique to ML. So. <laughs> so you want competing analyses? Uh, well, I guess that's all, a... all ML because or or ML and standard and even the standard give you the same answer. What? Oh, very simple. Just a mathematical proof that your ML is always uh, getting to the right conclusion. We have comments here also. You are not a tough no, referee, just... come on. Well, that proof is hard. Sorry to interrupt first. I just got distracted by the chocolate coins and, and then <laughs> that's all I'm thinking about. <laughs> I, think I, I agree with Guillaume, like, it's not about ML or not, it's any methods you get that, you know, those claims you have to take the same test, the same list of tests you come up with. So I hope, I would have hoped that the audience will actually come up with, uh, you know, more, more proposals, but let's leave that for later and in the interest of time, let me go on. I think what you want is this. What is this? <laughs> it's the duck test. It's the duck test. What's the duck test? It works like a duck. It looks like a duck. It smells like a duck. But I need some more quacking tests. And the list of principle. It looks like a duck, it works like a duck, but if it needs battery, you probably have the wrong abstraction. So what do you want to do here? I think it's what I call feature, which is the same thing as we say new measurement, the same thing that we say all you need is attention. You want some feature that are robust and consistent across different analyses, and that a direct connection to the physics probably fundamental. They are like a response to something that happened in the physics that this is what you are going after. So we know the neutrinos are, are, are hot, and we know that they have a high velocity dispersion. They know that they free stream. We want to see the effect of that physics in our data. Give it to me as property of the voids. Give it to me as suppression on the growth. Give it to me as a scale-dependent power spectrum growth. Give it whatever. We know that they are a relativistic component, so we have a F, uh, 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 they affect the, the, the matter transfer function. I want to see those, those features. And we want that those features predict other features which also have direct connection to other aspects of the physics that will be connected only by the fact that we are looking about the neutrinos and not, we are look, not looking about something else. Consistency test and null test. This is what I think would convince me as a referee, and I don't know if it would convince every other referee on Earth. We can leave that for the discussion later. But the thing that I want to ma mention, which was picked up by New York like a second ago, is that this request, it's quite generic. It's not only for machine learning, except that it's easier to do for more traditional approaches, also because we have been doing that for much longer with the traditional approaches. That's why they're called traditional. So maybe it's just a question of time, but I think we should have like this standard in mind, very clear, if we want to go for gold. And so, uh, I'm coming to my conclusion of the conclusion. Um, what uh, I think it was clear from all the, the discussion and the talk is that uh, uh, machine learning will change the type of valuable skills that we have and we need to do science. 
it will force a, a re-evaluation what is of value. When you write a paper, the amount of word that you put in the different parts of the paper, the, um, the way you write the abstract, the type of paper you want to write depends on what you think is of, of value. And so it, it's changing what, the forces us to reevaluate what we think is of value. It's it's, it uh, provides acceleration, provides efficiency, and free up time and resources for things that ML can't do well. So what are the things that ML can do well? We had a discussion about large language model and whether they can substitute us, whether they will take us away our job and things like that. So I want to leave you with this consideration, which is, which is not mine. And again, remember, I'm the one that I've done the list about machine learning, so I may be completely wrong. But I think uh, Judea Pearl is it's, it's quite on something. So it basically says that current machine learning system operate ex almost exclusively in a statistical or model-free sense. This are a limit as, as limitation because humans, that's what makes us different from the machine as they are right now, can imagine alternative hypothetical environment for planning and learning. What you call causality, what you call counterfactual, and what if. So the current algorithms do not have this casual reasoning. And this is the difference between what we do and what the machine do. So when we go back to the feature here, and when I was asking this, this is counterfactual, right? This is what if. And it's something that you haven't seen before. The machine can do that if it has seen it before, but it cannot have seen everything before. So. Since we talk about uh, pilots and co-pilots, we went from dog is my co-pilot to dog is my co-pilot to ML is my co-pilot. So probably it's going to be our co-pilot uh, starting from about now, except for me. Uh, but the question that we still need to pose is where do you want to go? And the co-pilot will not tell you where do you want to go. And so, I want to conclude by with some thanks. So first, thanks to all the speakers and the panelists, both in Paris and, uh, and in New York. Uh, I learned a lot, and I can't believe it's already over. So I wanted if we have uh, applause. <laughs> to the session chairs, you all were impeccable, and we were quite on time, which almost never happened. So thank you so much. <laughs> to all the participants in all the different times and wherever you are, there were lively discussion, questions, and participation. So thank you. Talk, lock, and support the staff. We thank them before, but we should not. We should remember that there wouldn't be a conference without them. So thank you again. <laughs> and last but not least, to the organizers. Only a few years ago, we would not even have imagined possible to do what you've done, but it went flawlessly, which is amazing. And I heard sometimes about machine learning algorithm. It can go wrong and you don't know why. The same thing happened for Zoom and connection. But I would like the organizers, <laughs> if it was possible, <laughs> to come up and get an applause from all of you. But so, we just yeah, yeah. We, we, we can because Guilhem is, is opening a, a door for people that need to okay, leave now. So, so we'll do that after. <laughs> we, can, we can wait for that. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. While we wait for Guilhem, perhaps a, a, a short uh, comment from, uh, from New York or concluding remark, Paco, because you also need to be there on the, on the, on the floor. Yes. I didn't understand what, what did you say, sorry. <laughs> ah, here's Guilhem. So, Paco, some remarks on, in New York. Uh, Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think at least for me it was 
a very, very nice uh, conference. You know, it was really amazing again, the EV and that everything was well. And yeah, thank you very much also to everybody coming here. Yes. Thanks, Paco, for organizing the, uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Yes. Thanks a lot. Can we thank the organizers, seriously, like with a round of applause? Thank you every for everyone for coming. It was great and I think we all learned a lot and it was a wonderful experience to be together and to uh, have all these interesting discussions. Yeah, no, I was also so thanking Paco because he jumped on the boat and he didn't know exactly where he was going. <laughs> <laughs> so next time, how many notes are you going to do? Sorry? Next time, how many notes are you going to do? <laughs> well, I don't know, three times up. <laughs> The next time I was saying that in two years we'll be able to do the same thing, each one is on language, and then something will translate. We'll see. <laughs> With hallucinations. <laughs> With hallucinations, as they're right. Okay. So I guess uh, we should stop here. So a last goodbye to New York. Uh, have a good rest of the day and a good weekend, and a goodbye to Paris, and safe travel to everybody, and thank you for being here. Thanks. Thank you, guys.